Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is part of our MGFC Family Center Care Series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General for Children. Before I get started, I just want to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that you can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for in the end. Only Blum Center staff, our co-host and guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'd be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. All right, so next I'm going to hand it over to Brianna Beckwell. She is the project manager and editor for Mass Gen for Children, and she'll introduce you all today's guest speaker. All right, thanks, Amy. So everyone, welcome to this session of the MGFC Family Centered Care Series at Mass General for Children, which is the pediatric branch of Mass General Hospital. Uh, this is where pediatric health experts share their knowledge on various pediatric health and family related topics. And this year we're collaborating with the Blum Patient and Family Learning Center at Mass General. And today we have Dr. Lorraine Schratz to hear tips on how to improve your child and family's heart health through a healthy lifestyle and how to talk about these changes in encouraging ways. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Dr. Schratz is an attending physician in pediatric cardiology and the director of the Raising Healthy Hearts program, which is a program that helps children and families who are facing challenges and health conditions related to weight or abnormal cholesterol levels or who have a family history of heart disease. She is also a diplomat in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. At the end of the session, Dr. Schwartz will be addressing questions, so if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box, as Amy mentioned, and we'll have time for them later. And from here, I will hand it over to our speaker. Thank you for that introduction, and I'm smiling because my dog was barking and the door was opening and closing, so here we are still giving presentations on Zoom. But thank you for the opportunity um, to speak with everybody today. So let me see if my screen share will work, which it looks like it is on my end. And looks like on your end as well. Um, so again, uh, the topic today is raising healthy hearts, tips for caregivers um, to help your children be healthy for a lifetime. Um, again, I'm the director of the Raising Healthy Hearts program and Brianna already read our mission. Um, but in addition to our mission running this special program, I, as a pediatric cardiologist, also consider it my mission to help prevent heart disease in children. So I tell my patients that I'd like for me to be the only cardiologist they ever need in their lives um, when it comes to their overall long-term heart health. So today our objectives are to review the health conditions which lead to heart disease. I'll talk about the six pillars of lifestyle medicine and give some practical suggestions for people to use at home. I'll encourage goal setting and then share a few resources. So first, what is heart disease? We hear this term a lot um, and it's really broad. It, heart disease is sort of for a doctor also um, synonymous with cardiovascular disease, which means the health conditions which result from a buildup of plaque in the blood vessels, which decrease blood flow. So it's kind of like a clogged drain. Um, and it, in this case, it's the arteries that carry blood um, to our body. Examples of heart disease include a heart attack, lack of blood flow to the heart, a stroke when people don't have enough blood flow to their brain. It can also include peripheral arterial disease or not enough blood flow um, typically to the legs and even high blood pressure. So what leads to heart disease? High cholesterol and high triglycerides certainly do. People have heard these terms. In, in brief, 
cholesterol and triglycerides are things that everyone has in their body and we need them for a lot of our functions, but when they get too high, our body can't use them. And they like to sort of float around and then stick to the inside of the blood vessels. And that's when they can cause problems. Diabetes also leads to heart disease. Smoking does. If people have a family history of heart disease, that's something in their genetics and their genetic makeup. And that makes it even more important that they follow the lifestyle recommendations that we'll talk about today. Being overweight can lead to heart disease. And older age is also associated with heart disease, usually over 45 in men and after women have gone through menopause. And so you might wonder, why is a pediatric cardiologist talking about this topic? It's because plaque buildup in our blood vessels starts in childhood. And so it's important now to try to lead our kids to um, healthy lifestyles to minimize that. So what should we do? Hopefully after this talk, you'll have some idea. So the six pillars of lifestyle medicine include healthy eating, which we'll talk a fair bit about today, physical activity, positive social connections, handling of stress in healthy ways, getting good sleep, and avoidance of substance use. So we're going to focus on healthy eating and then to a lesser extent physical activity, and I'll touch on these other the other topics, the other pillars as well. So first, just the basics about healthy eating. If this was all I was going to tell you in this lecture, this would be the slide. So what should we be eating? We should be eating lots of fruits and vegetables. A primarily plant-based diet has been shown in multiple studies to be associated with better health, including better um, cardiovascular health. Whole grains, which means um, not refined wheat products. So um, the, the you know brown breads or breads that look like they have you know kind of nuts in them. We should eat lean proteins, um, especially beans and legumes such as lentils, and we should be drinking water. So that means on the other side of the screen, what should we limit or try to avoid completely? So we should be limiting ultra processed foods and our society is just full of them. Everywhere you go, if you walk into a convenience store, you're going to see ultra processed foods. And that's because our um, economy has found that marketing to busy Americans, this is the kind of food we'll grab and go. Unfortunately, they are processed to be as far away from actual whole foods that started at a farm um, and have had a lot of added ingredients and are very calorically dense, meaning they have a lot of calories, but not a lot of nutrition. Kind of hand in hand with the ultra processed foods in bags and boxes are fast foods. I like to tell my patients, we should not be driving up to windows and have our food handed to us. Um, that's kind of an instant, not healthy um, sign. We should avoid drinks and foods that have sugar, including juice. So juice is really just a sugar sweetened beverage, just like soda is. And then red meat should be limited to once a week. So where on earth do we start? Well, first of all, parents and caregivers start often with a baby. Um, and we are teaching our children how to eat from the very beginning. And so you may have heard of the term responsive feeding. We should be feeding our babies in response to their cues that they are hungry. So a baby may start to like lick their lips or smack or suck. They may clench their fist or turn towards a bottle or towards mom's breast. Um, and that's a good signal that they're hungry. If they're crying, um, they you probably miss those other cues. And so it's really important to trust and follow a baby's feeding cues. So also when they're full, if they're turning away from the bottle or the breast, um, if you know they're getting sleepy and they're not interested, those are signs that they're done. And that's really important to pay attention to with our very young children because that's how they learn their own hunger cues and how to respond to them so that they can avoid eating past hunger when they're older. And I'll take just a point here to say that your baby's doctor knows best. So there are certainly some medical conditions where um, you may have to 
kind of go extra time to feed the baby. And so trust your doctor and ask for their guidance, please. Again, this is general medical uh, advice, not for any one specific baby. Um, so as far as older babies and toddlers, most babies are ready for table foods at about six months of age when they can sit up um, and have good head control. Um, and really importantly, our taste buds are trained between four months and four years. So this is the ideal time to encourage children to eat their fruits and vegetables and other healthy foods and to try new things. So for example, um, you might offer a baby maybe spinach and they make a face. Don't read that as they don't like spinach and never give them spinach again. It's just that that's something they haven't experienced before and it has a strong taste. Baby's taste buds are way stronger than adult taste buds and um, they need to get used to it. So keep trying with the healthy foods. Don't rule anything out. Iron fortified cereals, including oats, which are whole grain, are um, good for young ones. And then a rainbow of colors. And um, some families like to make their own baby food by pureeing food that the family eats, or you can look for all natural baby foods with no sugar added, and that's okay as well. And then again, avoid processed foods and, and sugars. So that's really not nutritive for your little ones. So in terms of slightly older kids, um, family habits really make a difference. So family routines and family dinners are really important because it gives a nice peaceful time for children to learn how to eat, not in a hurry and not in front of some device. It's useful to have predictable meal times and if needed, a snack time. Children don't necessarily need a snack, but some might need one um, in the mid-afternoon after school. And uh, again, fruits and vegetables are a wonderful snack. I always tell my patients, um, parents, to put the veggies out first. So if your house is anything like my house, when you're preparing dinner, kids are always hungry and asking you, you know, when's dinner, when can I eat? Um, and that's often when family members, adults as well, will start going and grabbing things out of the pantry that maybe are not as healthy. So one trick is to put out cut up fruits or cut up vegetables first um, out on the counter while you're preparing the rest of dinner. And it, it, people have found that in fact, their kids will eat it then when they're hungry. The other trick is to let children help with the prep, including grocery shopping. So treat it as a field trip to the grocery store and let them look at all the fruits and vegetables and pick out something that they'd like to try. And then in terms of what should the meal be like, talk at the table. Um, that's not the time to, you know, be scolding children or talking about something unpleasant, make it as fun and happy a time as possible. And certainly encourage family members to leave their phones and other devices somewhere else. In fact, people who eat while they're looking at a device or a, a television or a computer have been shown to eat more. You probably have seen this before. Um, this is just the breakdown of, of what should our plate look like. And essentially half of the plate should be fruits and vegetables. If it sounds like I'm repeating that a lot, that there's a reason. Um, and the more veggies, the better, greater variety and lots of different colors. Drink water. And again, I said whole grains and um, fish, poultry, beans, um, and nuts are also a protein. Limit red meat and cheese. In terms of the saturated fats that increase our cholesterol and lead to heart disease, in the United States, the top three sources of those are number one, processed foods, number two, red meat, number three, cheese. Um, and it's not that you can't have cheese or you can't have red meat. Again, it's just more of a question of how much are you eating? So I thought this study was really quite interesting. At Cornell, um, a little more than 15 years ago, uh, Dr. Wansick did a research project trying to determine when people feel like they've had enough to eat. And um, 
what he did was there were participants sitting at a table eating soup. And for some of the participants, there was a tube that kept filling their bowl with more soup. And for participants who had this bowl that just kept getting filled up with soup slowly as they were eating, they ate more than the participants who didn't have the bowls that got filled up automatically. And so we look to external triggers to determine when we've had enough to eat. And so oftentimes we're full when we're done, but the portion size that we're given in many circumstances isn't really what we should be having. Um, if you ever paid attention and looked at you know, a, a, a processed food bag or a box, they'll you'll have a container and it'll say serving size and oftentimes it's like a quarter of what they've given you but people don't necessarily stop when they've had a quarter of that item and so this is one of the the um, issues that can come up for people so in order to eat more appropriate portions put less on the plate and even less on the table so this is just a graphic when when we talk about um proper portions and using the plate, that is using a nine inch dinner plate. And our plates actually at restaurants and other places are often bigger. So this is actually my slide to tell people that you can actually help yourself by using a paper plate. Um, so on the left side of the screen is a nine inch plate, that ceramic that is all portioned to help people know how much to eat when they're having their meals. And you can see it's, you know, half for the fruits and vegetables and a quarter for the grains and a quarter for the proteins. And if you look on the right, that's just a typical paper plate, which is just about nine inches. So I'm talking about a lot of tips and things to try to do at home, which might some of them seem like more work. Um, but this one is a freebie. If you use paper plates, you have the right size plate and you have fewer dishes. Another interesting study looked at um, people's kitchens and researchers went in and took pictures of what was out on the counter and what was visible in people's homes. And not too surprisingly, what they found was for people who had soda visible on the counter um, or cookies, those people at the end of a year had actually gained weight and those who had fruit on their counter had maintained or even lost weight. And so we do eat what we see. If, if that's in front of you, that bowl of apples and bananas, you're more likely to take one and eat it. And so it's another tip to encourage your family members and in particular your children to eat healthy foods. So my summary of healthy eating, eat food that looks like food, eat plants, eat together and talk to each other and keep trying new fruits and vegetables. Do not be discouraged when the kids don't like something. Again, their taste buds are more sensitive than yours. They have to try multiple times before they really know that they don't like it. Um, and then also sometimes people have a hard time getting fresh fruit and vegetables. And if you do, please talk to your doctor or other um, clinician, healthcare clinician, because we can tap you into some resources for that so that you can take some of these tips on. And so just a couple comments about encouraging words to use. So um, one of the things that can be problematic is if eating or healthy habits like movement or sleep become a battle between parents. And so, um, Try to use encouraging words, um, and in you know instead of calling something a treat because who doesn't want a treat, call that a sometimes food versus everyday foods. Um, and we know that if you completely restrict a, a child or an adult from some of the you know things we might consider treats, they're more likely to overindulge when they eat those. So a healthy way of looking at it is a sometimes food versus an everyday food. And talk to your children about eating to be strong um, and healthy. And then last, I grew up in a time when I really was discouraged from playing with my food. So you weren't really allowed to kind of poke it or touch it or smell it. 
Um, and actually, that's really helpful for children, particularly picky eaters. Um, so some who are maybe reluctant, as long as they can interact in some way with a new food, that's a useful step and allow them to do that. Sometimes kids won't want to put anything in their mouth, but they might be willing to smell it and put it on their to their lips. And that's a step in the right direction. So let your kids have a sensory experience with their food. Hopefully you can kind of contain it so that they don't make a mess, but be patient with that. So I'm going to move on to physical activity. Um, I will just make a comment that last year, um, myself and one of the Raising Healthy Hearts registered dietitians gave a talk on physical activity, and that is available um, on the Blum Center website. Um, so if you really want to hear about physical activity, there's a whole nother lecture for you. But we'll tap into that now as physical activity is one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. So what do kids need? Children ages six to 17 years need 60 minutes of active play every day. Um, that doesn't mean that they have to go to um, you know, basketball practice for an hour. It just means activity that gets their heart rate up and gets them breathing a little bit harder um, is active play. For preschoolers, the recommendation is much more broad. They should just be active all day with a variety of different activities using different muscle groups. And for adults, because I know we're, I'm talking to adults, um, we should be active at least 150 minutes a week, which is half hour, five days a week, um, plus two days of strength training. And I know that can be hard. Um, and, you know, the reality is something is better than nothing. And additionally, that 150 minutes can occur on the weekend. So how do we get our children to be physically active? I think the first bullet point there is the most important. Emphasize fun. So anything you do, if you're trying to get your child out to walk outside in a local park, it shouldn't be because they ate too much at dinner the last night. That's not encouraging. It should be because, hey, I found this new park and it's really cool. I want to go see it. Come on, let's go. Um, so emphasize fun and actually play play with your children. It's important to be a role model. So, you know, make time for movement yourself. For younger kids um, and school age kids, provide active toys. Older kids also could use toys, but um, things like balls and jump ropes and you know that sort of thing. Obviously, you're gonna make sure the environment is safe. I often hear from certain patients that they don't live in an area where they can send their children out to play. Um, and so those are issues that each family will need to decide for themselves, but you can come up with some active things to do inside the house. Um, choose an activity that's age appropriate. So for example, you're not going to take your six-year-old on a five-mile run with you, even though I said play with your children and be a role model. That just won't work because they don't have the endurance or the strength or the leg length to keep up with you. Set limits on screens. That's one that I think everybody has heard. Um, the more time children spend um, on their devices, playing video games, the less time they're moving. There are some active video games, and so um, those are useful, but for the most part, it should be a limit of two hours per day of screens, and that always seems like a lot to me, but I have kids, so I know it can be easy, easy for them to go over that, um, and we don't count school towards the screen time. And then last, don't overdo it. What you don't want to do is take what is supposed to be fun and turn it into torture or um, really something very unpleasant for a child. So respond to what they're giving you for feedback and also respond to your own body. Um, if something is hurting, it's time to slow down and take a break. So just a nice little slide to say there's a lot to do. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of some of the classic games. So even if you don't have a park to go to, perhaps you have a sidewalk and chalk that you can get at the dollar store and teach your kids hopscotch because it's a great game and it's active and it can teach things like numbers and cooperation and taking turns. You can go for walks or hikes with your kids on these cold days in New England. Active 
play indoors could include using pillows to make forts or, you know, jumping from pillow to pillow. Obviously, be mindful if you have downstairs neighbors. You don't want to do this late at night, and we'll get to that in sleep. Um, Twister's a great game, and uh, of course, all, all kinds of sports and, and other games. So now I'm going to move on to sleep. So I just mentioned don't be jumping around at 10 o'clock at night um, to keep your downstairs neighbors up. Um, and really, we should be going to bed at about that time. We so very often overlook sleep. And it's a shame because I think most people like to sleep. Lack of sleep 100% links to cardiovascular disease. Um, even though I don't think most people know this. So when we don't get enough sleep, we have an increase in our stress hormones and that can lead to high blood pressure and all the other signs of stress. It also leads to increase in hunger. Um, there are hunger hormones in our brains and um, lack of sleep and the stress related to that actually can trigger the hunger hormones. We're tired when we don't sleep, so we don't want to be active. As a result, we can gain weight. And lack of sleep in children also leads them to have difficulties with focus um, in school and can even appear to be like ADHD. And then this last one, again, is for the adults listening to the talk. Adults who sleep less than seven hours a night have increased high rate of high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and depression. So again, sleep is really important. What about kids? So this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the recommendations um, for amount of time sleeping for children. And you'll see it starts out high for the little ones and um, decreases, and that includes naps all the way up through the preschool years. And then ages six to 12, so that really is up to the beginning of middle school, they need nine to 12 hours a night of sleep. And our teenagers need eight to 10 hours of sleep a night and very often are not getting that. So how do you encourage a healthy sleep? First off, you should have bedtime. Um, so bedtime for children, um, even young adults, shouldn't be whenever they fall asleep on the couch. It really should be a set time at night, taking into consideration what time they need to wake up in the morning so that they get those recommended hours of sleep. It's useful to have a routine at the end of the night to wind down. And for most people, that could be brushing your teeth, taking a bath, putting on your pajamas, maybe reading a book, um, but really shouldn't be any um, screen time. We should be keeping devices um, like phones and televisions out of our bedrooms and certainly out of our beds. The light that comes out of those devices interferes with our ability to, to fall asleep and stay asleep well. Eating, ideally, we should not do within three hours of bedtime. And that's for several different reasons. Um, some people could have reflux after they eat, they lay down and they get heartburn. Um, others will have an increase in their blood sugar, but then it decreases while they're asleep, which can cause them to wake up and even feel hungry and want to go have a snack at night, which isn't the healthiest. Um, it's easier to sleep if the room is kept a little bit cooler um, and, of course, dark. Oh, and I'll just mention um, for sleeping, if your child is snoring at night, that's something to bring up to their um, pediatrician or family physician or other clinician um, because that could possibly be sleep apnea um, where they have obstruction to their airway, which is associated with heart disease um, and it would be something potentially to be treated. So just one slide um, about substances. Um, the children are probably not having any impact from this except for what they see. Teenagers and even middle schoolers, a little bit different, sadly, in our society. Um, but if, if you yourself or anyone in the home is smoking or using other substances, ask for help in quitting. Kids do see what um, adults are doing around them and they think it's okay. We know that it is hard to quit smoking, so do ask for support, but it's easier to never start 
using that. Um, and again, no question that tobacco smoking is associated with heart disease. So one of the other pillars is social connections. Um, social connections are really important just for our overall well-being and feelings of happiness. It also helps us feel motivated. So um, it, the children that are young generally have their social connections through their family and, and caregivers. And then when they start to expand their social circle beyond the home, it's friends and teachers and maybe people that they know through their activities. I just got done talking about a whole lot of um, suggested things to do, including physical activity and healthy eating, and know that one way to get your child enthused about doing those things is to involve a friend. So maybe your child is not all that interested in going to the grocery store and picking out healthy fruits and vegetables with you, but they might want to do that with a friend that they then have over for um, a, a social time together. So now's my moment to pause. There was a ton of information and a ton of suggestions and many, many more that I could give. Um, we always encourage in Raising Healthy Hearts for our families and our patients that are old enough to do this to set a SMART goal. Um, it is obvious that you can't do everything and you can't do it all at once. And so it's really important to just focus on when you think about all these lifestyle habits, what is really relevant to you? What matters to you? What matters to your child? Um, and what are you feeling that is something within your grasp to, to change or to add as a healthy habit or subtract as a less healthy habit? And that's going to be different for all people at all times. So, you know, just pause for a moment and think about all of those things. Um, and then if you have a pencil or a pen, you may want to write down the area you want to focus on and be specific. So for example, if one of the changes you'd like to make is having fruits and vegetables out before the rest of the meal to encourage eating, think about how many days a week is that realistic and what do you need to do to make it happen? Um, and, and then decide in what time frame are you going to do it? That way it's really short and sweet. You know what you need to do. Um, and you'll know at the end of the week if you were successful at doing that. Um, so again, really encourage people to just think about what is it they are interested in doing. It's not going to be everything. It's going to be, you know, one or two things and just pick one or two. If your child is old enough uh, to talk with you and engage, then encourage them to be involved as well, because that's going to lead to success. Okay, so my last um, summing it up slide, there is a, a pillar for lifestyle medicine on stress management. And I recognize that I just gave this lecture of all of this information, and that's stressful. So I'm going to ask everybody just to take a moment, sit comfortably in their chair, and just be where you are and take a nice deep breath in and a deep breath out. And be really centered here in this moment. It's okay to be where you are and to take on only what you're ready to do. In terms of other stress management, doing activities such as hobbies or crafts, doodling, coloring with your kids, taking a walk in nature. Those are all centering activities that are very similar to meditation in that if you can just be and be present and use your senses to be aware of what's around you, you will get that calming hormonal response in your body, which 100% uh, helps with things like high blood pressure helps with well-being, and has even been shown to lower cholesterol. So again, one more deep breath in and out. So here are some resources for more support. The first is our Raising Healthy Hearts um, patient resource page. The second is the healthychildren.org from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And there's a lot of information from the American Heart Society, which is heart.org. And my little summary slide, eat plants, keep moving, 
sleep well, be present, stay calm, and love people. Thank you for your attention. And may you all be well. Hey, thank you so much, Lorraine. I love that little um, end slide you had there. It summarizes so nicely. Uh, apologies if you hear background noise on my end. Um, so now we have time for our Q&A. Um, our first question is, what are your tips for preparing healthy meals and snacks for families who have busy schedules? So, um, Everyone has a busy schedule. I think that in in you know 2023 and probably for the last couple of decades, um, we all just run around. So my tips are to think ahead, figure out first off what day of the week can you actually think about your week ahead and your food and where you're going to go. Some people find that to be one of the days on the weekend. I think most commonly, unless you work on the weekends, and then it may be during the week. Um, planning really helps. Having food that you prepare ahead of time and take with you is really useful. Um, so cutting up celery or carrots, um, and you can keep them in cold water in your refrigerator and they'll be ready to grab and go, um, just throwing them in a container to take with you. And lots of fruit is just really portable. So having fruit to take with you is useful. And, you know, I, I can speak for myself. At the end of my work days, I'm driving home and I start that, oh my gosh, I'm starving feeling. And so it's so helpful to just have something in the car that's, you know, ready to go um, and without much preparation. So that's one. Um, the other one is to work on some recipes that are either quick to make or can be prepped ahead. I'm a big fan of crock pots and you can prepare a lot of things in the crock pot. You can, you know, do the cut up and the prep ahead of time, like I said, on the weekend, and then you throw it in the morning, in the crock pot in the morning or even the night before and put it on low and then dinner's ready when you come home and who doesn't love that. Um, again, the biggest thing to do is to try to avoid the drive throughs um, because, you know, that's just a, a source of more calories and saturated fats um, that leads to heart disease. So hopefully that was some good tips. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, our next question is, uh, I think you touched on this a little bit, if you could expand on it. Um, what are some recommendations for families who may not have access to healthy foods or their access is limited um, and places to be active? So uh, first, with regard to the food, um, if you really don't know where to go for food, ask the people who know about resources. And again, that would be your family physician or your child's doctor or your own doctor. There are um, food pantries in most bigger communities. YMCA's that during the pandemic started giving away food. You do have to go on the internet to look for that. Um, if you have a mass general physician, we actually have a, like a whole group that helps with those kinds of referrals. So again, tell your physician. Um, and then if, you know, maybe you just are feeling like, oh gosh, fresh, fresh produce is really expensive. There are some um, companies set up, there's a misfits market that will um, deliver to you, to your door, food that just looks kind of ugly, but it's edible. So they can't put it in the grocery store because nobody apparently wants to buy an ugly looking carrot, um, but it's a carrot nonetheless. So that's one suggestion. And I'm, I'm not remembering the name and we can kind of maybe tag it later. I'll comment under the video when it gets posted. Um, there is an agency that takes food from restaurants, like surplus food from restaurants, and makes that available to people as well. Um, so, and, and there's St. Vincent de Paul food pantries as well. So there are a lot of resources, but I know it can be really overwhelming when you just don't know where to go and you don't have time um, to look. And so please, please speak with your healthcare provider. So that was some food. The other one was exercise. Um, so I think with, with regard to exercise, it's really going to vary by community and family to family. So even in some suburban neighborhoods where there are sidewalks and not a lot of cars coming down the street, some families just aren't comfortable letting their children go outside. 
So it, it's really understandable and everyone has to kind of do what they are comfortable with. Uh, if your children are in school, I would look to their to the school for resources. Um, many schools have after school programs and there's boys and girls clubs and YMCAs where the kids can go and they have gyms or pools to swim in. So that's useful. If the family has access to transportation, then you can look up and at least have it as a fun outing on a weekend to go to a park. Um, maybe that's not close to home for a daily use. And then last, I have some patients who would put on music and just have dance parties at home. It's a great opportunity for that social connection between parents and children. You know, <laughs> people are probably younger than me who have the little kids now, but it, you know, for example, my kids used to like it if I would put on disco music and I was pretty young during the disco era, but nonetheless, I had kind of the you know, John Travolta moves. Um, and I think that there are families living in the United States who've come from other cultures who have their cultural music and cultural dances. Um, and I just think it's a great opportunity for people to share with their kids. Absolutely. Um, I, I love that idea. Um, and just to be clear, the hospital doesn't endorse any uh, brands that are mentioned here. We're just using them as examples. Um, our next question, what are your thoughts on frozen and canned fruits and vegetables? Are those considered healthy options? Um, so yes, but please look at the labels. So um, fresh mm. produce would be considered the ideal. Again, it's the closest to the farm. So the closer you can get your food to where it left the source, the better. Um, frozen fruits and vegetables usually are just the fruit or the vegetable flash frozen. Um, so those are good. With canned goods, you just need to make sure that you're checking to see if there's added sodium or sugar. Excellent. Um, and what about canned fruit? Because sometimes it's canned in juice versus syrup. What, what are your thoughts on that? So it, it would be ideal to avoid syrup. So basically, if you are eating fruit out of a can that's in syrup, it's like sprinkling sugar on top of the fruit. And, you know, sugar shouldn't be an added uh, dietary substance for us. So you want to avoid the, the syrup. If it says packed in natural juices, then that's typically not sweetened. Thank you so much. Um, our next question also related to food. Um, how does a family's cultural preference for food factor into um, the diet recommendations that you mentioned, such as white rice is very common in many Asian dishes. And, and so oftentimes people can try brown rice. Some people like it and some people are like, nope, it just doesn't do it. And so I think it's really important not to take in, uh, you know, all, everything has to be changed um, and be, you know, exactly what I said, especially as long as you're keeping into account what a serving size is. So most of the time we all tend to, back to that soup bowl that kept filling up, we tend to eat more than is a typical serving size. And a serving size of rice for all of us is half a cup. So, you know, that's that's probably the more important keep in mind or, or the plate. Think about the plate and how much of the rice should be, you know, filling up the plate. And so I think people need to do what makes them happy. Food is supposed to make us feel happy and connected. Um, and so it, it, that's an important part of our nutrition, just as it is giving us the nutrients that we need to grow and be healthy. Great, thank you. Um, let me check our chat box here. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I possibly we could wrap up early um, or if you have any other uh, last minute thoughts you'd like to share. So I think it might, the last minute thought would really just be that this is a journey. So, you know, you listen to my lecture or you go onto a, a website or you hear somebody else talk about what you and your children should be doing. And take those as, okay, that's advice. I need to, how to, need to figure out how to integrate that into my life and what works for me. We're all on a journey. And just like I talked about everyday foods and sometimes foods, uh, you know, there are going to be times when we don't exercise as much because maybe something else is going on at home and you just can't. 
and that's okay. You know, it, it's it, don't think that you have completely failed yourself and your child because you have a day or a month or some time that you sort of did other things and just come back. It's okay. We want you, you know, health for a lifetime. That's kind of the whole point. It's the lifetime. So I think that would be my closing thought is to, you know, be kind to yourselves. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and from here, I will hand it over to Amy to wrap up. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. For everyone taking the time to join us, thank you so much. Hopefully you found today's session helpful. As I had mentioned, today's session is being recorded. So if you're interested in viewing the recording, you can visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. And you'll also see in the chat, I included a link to last year's talk. So if you're interested in viewing that recording, that's also in the chat. And other than that, have a good rest of the day. All right, bye.